Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to talk about what happened for paleontology in September of 2020. And so let's get started. The first paper we're going to look at discusses just how much of an impact the Permian-Triassic extinction, the most severe extinction of all time, may have impacted different animals' development and evolution of endothermy, or being warm-blooded. The authors suggest that during the early, mid, and late Triassic, there was a kind of evolutionary arms race occurring between the cynodonts, which are animals that are very closely related to mammals, and the lineage that would eventually lead to the dinosaurs, with both of them developing warm-bloodedness endothermy very, very quickly during this time period. There are a few features which help to indicate that this may be the case. The first of which is having a more erect stance, with the legs directly under the body. This is again something we see in the ancestors to mammals, and then again in the dinosaurs. We also see the start of body coverings, so things like fur and also feathers, at least in the dinosaurs with the feathers. And finally, there have been different structures in the bone, especially when compared to cold-blooded animals like the lizards or crocodilians. This is something that again is happening convergently in both groups. The evolution of endothermy likely led to the success of both of the groups that had it, with the dinosaurs being wildly successful in the Mesozoic, and then the mammals coming and becoming more prominent in the Cenozoic. And while the dinosaurs didn't survive the KT extinction or KPG extinction, the mammals did, and the fact that they had already evolved this endothermy may have been part of the reason that we've become so successful into the Cenozoic and up until the modern day. Meaning, as devastating as the Permian-Triassic extinction was, it may have helped lay the groundwork for how the mammals, including ourselves, became so successful. So in the Triassic, and also looking at the transitions to modern faunas, we're going to be looking at the Carnian Pluvial episode. The Carnian was a stage in the late Triassic which saw massive amounts of climate change, and the authors of this paper suggest that there may have been another sixth mass extinction that occurred during this time. This kind of mass extinction will take more study to definitely distinguish and define to make sure it was indeed a mass extinction, and not just a fairly large, not quite mass extinction, which is generally defined by over 50% of species dying off. However, the authors were able to show that about 33% of marine genera did definitely die off, and the rest is still a little more up in the air. There needs to be more research done to make sure. On land, it's believed there was a similar pattern of extinctions. However, it's harder to prove that due to the inherent biases of the fossil record against animals that lived on land. A large part of this is because whenever you get a fossil, it needs to be buried by something. Mud, sand, whatever. And unfortunately, land-based life forms aren't likely to get buried. They're more likely to stay at the surface and rot away. However, if it's in the water, you're more likely to get sand or mud carried by that water to cover it up and have it preserved as a fossil. What this means is that the land-based fauna during this time in the Carnian is a little harder to nail down. However, it does coincide with a number of major transitions into many of the groups that we see today. For example, this was one of the main diversification events for many of the mammals, lizards, and conifer tree groups that we see even up until the modern day, meaning that this single event of climate change likely helped to lead to a lot of the modern fauna we have today, rather than being something more like the Paleozoic fauna, or even including some of the very, very strange crocodilians that were dominant before the dinosaurs and later birds took over many parts of the environment. The cause of this climate change was likely the eruption of the Rangelia Large Igneous Province, a series of massive volcanoes like some of the others I've mentioned on the channel, which erupted at around the right time off the coast of North America about 225 million years ago. As I mentioned, I've mentioned these kinds of flood basalts in the past, and that's because they have been coinciding with a lot of different climate change events that we see throughout the fossil and geological record. This likely indicates that this kind of pollution that is caused by these, which does release a lot of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, is probably one of the main drivers of climate change in the geologic record. And something we should be aware of, since our own current emissions, but we don't have any of these massive volcanic provinces going off, is approaching very similar levels to many of these events and so we really should try and reduce emissions as much as possible. As for geologic climate data, there is one place that we found some which really isn't expected, and that's in the bones of metoposaurs. Metoposaurs were a group of amphibians or very close amphibian relatives, which lived throughout the Carboniferous through around the late Cretaceous. It's unsure exactly when they died out, because their fossils had become very rare by the time the last one shows up, Coolosuchus. A bone study of Panthosaurus, an Indian member of this group, helped to show how it might have grown, and how climate might have helped impact it. And that's because of other metoposaurs which have been studied beforehand that showed differential growth. 
One other member, Metoposaurus, coming from Poland, showed, like Panthosaurus, no lines of arrested growth in the bone, meaning that the animal would have stopped growing due to a very stressful environment. This is contrasted from the Moroccan Dutuitosaurus, which had very significant lines of arrested growth, meaning it would have had a much more harsh environment and would have made it much harder for the animal to actually survive during certain parts of the year. What this means is even just bone growth can help us understand at least localized climate in different geologic settings. And with these kinds of very interesting and very detailed analyses, we can get a better understanding of how much the animals were able to thrive there and how much they had special adaptations, such as slowing down their growth in the case of Tuichosaurus, in order to become as successful as they were. Now moving from amphibians to animals with amphibious lifestyles, meaning they can move from water to land and back to water, we have some of the oldest records of air breathing in the fossil record. Coming from the Carboniferous, there's a new fossil of a Eurypterid, which shows structures called trabeculae. These are small holes in arthropods, which allow air to pass through the exoskeleton and into the tissues so that they can actually breathe air, something that's very important for animals that are starting to go onto land. While Eurypterids are often called sea scorpions, they aren't true scorpions, they're just closely related. However, this find does indicate at least a few very interesting things about how this ability to breathe air in the arachnids might have developed. It's been long questioned whether or not the Eurypterids were actually able to get onto land, or if that was a totally novel and completely unique approach to living in this clade for just the arachnids, the scorpions and the spiders, which nowadays all live on land. This evidence, combined with a fossil scorpion coming from the Silurian that was announced earlier this year, helps to show that these animals were probably already well on their way to living on land by the time the first true arachnids had actually evolved, meaning that rather than being a novel approach, it was something that was already in development in the clade. This paper, particularly the fact that the Eurypterids could breathe air, also helps to indicate that it's likely that the Eurypterids and the arachnids could very well move onto land at least fairly early on. And this is far different than another paper which has suggested that another member of this clade, the horseshoe crabs, were actually arachnids that moved back to water. And that's because we don't see any of this kind of trabeculae in the fossil horseshoe crabs that we have. Instead, it's more likely that horseshoe crabs were always fairly limited to being very near water. And while they can go onto land today, that's because they use book gills which they can soak with water in order to make short journeys, rather than having these trabeculae in order to breathe air. It also suggests, again, that the arachnids were necessarily totally novel in their approach to going on land, but rather it was just the final step in their evolution to becoming their own individualized clade that has become as successful as it is today. And now for animals that were near the water but not necessarily in it, we have the first evidence of probe feeding in the pterosaurs. Probe feeding is very similar to what a lot of different shorebirds do today where they use long bills to poke for different food and invertebrates underneath mud or sand. Leptostomia bagayensis is known almost entirely from fossils of its very, very narrow beak. And this is a very unique thing because it's also very well preserved, meaning we can see certain features on it, such as very small holes called fenestra, which would have been very useful for having certain nerve fibers pass through them, so that the animal could feel around under the mud and shift its grip if it needed to in order to find a different worm or other invertebrate. While very partial, these kinds of features that are very well preserved help us to understand and be confident in giving it its own genus and name for a species. It also helps indicate just how much diversity there may have been in the pterosaurs, as its closest relatives, or at least its likely closest relatives, definitely weren't doing probe feeding. And that's because its closest relatives were probably the Astarchids, which include massive animals like Quetzalcoatlus, as opposed to the fairly diminutive, by comparison, Leptostomia. And now, moving into dinosaurs, we have two new fossils representing a single genus of a new basal ornithopod coming from the early Cretaceous. Chiangmiania leoninensis is likely so well preserved as these two fossils show because of one of its behaviors, and that's digging burrows. It's not entirely unknown that some of these animals might have dug burrows, particularly in some of its closest relatives, like Erectodromius. And with these two animals being in such lifelike poses, there's a good chance that they were buried simply because their burrows collapsed on them. It's not exactly known why this collapse might have happened. It could have simply been a poor sediment for the animals to dig a burrow in, and the sediment couldn't hold up the weight of the roof itself. It could have also been some of the nearby volcanic activity, which some other authors have suggested may have been the cause for other fossils being buried in the area. 
Regardless of what exactly the case was for why these fossils were so well preserved, the fact that they are will likely lead to more insights in how the ornithopods might have evolved, particularly again as these are such late lasting into the early Cretaceous, but also very basal, meaning they would have diverged far earlier than a lot of the other ornithopods we know, including things like the Iguanodontians and the Hadrosaurs. This gives us a great insight into how the early ornithopods may have developed. Now we're going to be moving into the theropods, with a study on one of the strangest ones yet. What we understand of the theropods and some of their growth largely comes from very similar bone studies to that that was done in the metoposaurs. These kinds of lines of arrested growth could help indicate the kind of growth speed that the animal would have had, as well as just certain structures in the bone being able to help indicate what kind of growth speed the animal might have had. While these kinds of studies have gotten very popular in the past few decades, that doesn't necessarily mean that all these kinds of different clades of the dinosaurs are particularly well sampled, and a large part of that is because it is a somewhat destructive process, at least when you're inherently looking at what you need to do. You need to take a small slice of bone, put it onto glass, and then very carefully grind it down to about 30 microns thick, and microns are smaller than na nanometers, so we are looking at very, very thin pieces of bone. However, that allows light to pass through them, meaning when you put them in a microscope, you can see different structures as the light comes through the bone. As for the taxon that was looked at in this particular study, we're looking at Vespersaurus, which made news in 2019 for being the first known dinosaur to run on only one toe. Now, what the researchers were able to find is that, like one of its relatives, Magiacosaurus, it had a very particular bone type. Vespersaurus and Magiacosaurus both had parallel running bone fibers, and this is something that's more indicative of much more slow-growing animals, even in the modern day. And this is very much contrasted with other dinosaurs, such as Tyrannosaurus rex, or even the more closely related Abelosauroid Acusaurus, which had fibromelar bone, which allows more blood vessels to pass through and allows the animal to grow to a much larger size much quicker. Additionally, there is a third specimen of a different kind of dinosaur that hasn't been formally described yet, but is, as far as we can tell, fairly closely related to both Vespersaurus and Magiacosaurus. And it also had this kind of very same parallel running bone fibers. What this indicates is that, that the particular clade of Magiacosaurs may have actually been under far less evolutionary pressure to try and grow rapidly, and that could indicate at least some things about behavior. For example, if the Magiacosaurs, like Vespersaurus and Magiacosaurus, were mainly hunting small prey, they wouldn't necessarily need to grow to a large size very quickly in order to still subdue that small prey. Meanwhile, things like Acusaurus hunting larger prey would have been under significantly more evolutionary pressure to obtain that larger size, so that it would be safer to hunt and they'd be less likely to get injured. So these kinds of detailed bone studies don't just show us about climate like I mentioned with the Notoposaurus study, they can actually indicate a lot about how the animal's behavior might have been. And now outside of the dinosaurs, but at the same time period, we have a brand new Sebakid crocodilian, and one of the most unique ones, at least as far as time period goes, that we know of. The newly named species is Ogresaurus ferratus, and represents the oldest known Sebacid, and also comes from a place where we haven't found any other Sebacids for thousands of miles around. And that's because this Sebacid comes from the Catalonia region of Spain, whereas up until this point we had found no Sebacids anywhere else in all of Eurasia, meaning that this is a very unique species that tells us a lot about how the group may have spread. Specifically, what this suggests is that the Sebacids would have had to evolve much earlier than we thought. And that's because we find them both here in Catalonia, but also in South America. In order to get to all of these places, they would have needed to start evolving before the final breakup of Pangaea. It also suggests with this earlier evolution date, that they would have been much more suited and much more prepared to try and compete with the different land-based dinosaurs and predators that were around during the time period. This finding of Ogresaurus, a crocodilian, suggests that the dinosaurs may not have had as tight of a grip on land-based environments as we may have thought, and that there may have actually been a lot more competition in ecological biodiversity that we just don't find that often in the fossil record. Moving on, we're going to be looking at animals that weren't in competition with dinosaurs because of their differing habitats, but definitely would have been around at the same time, and that's two new genera of Mosasaurus. The first was a specimen that had formerly been called Prognothodon statimani. Now, this was originally found in the 1970s, and was named this based on the very small amount of it that had been prepared. However, there's been quite a few years since the 1970s, and more of the fossil has been prepared out of the rock. This helped to show some of the different features that may have caused it to be called a different genus 
rather than a prognophodon. Some of these features were fairly small, such as a lack of fusion between the suprastapedial process and the tympanic rim of the ear. However, these kinds of very small features are part of what is very important when we're looking at how different animals would have evolved and how they might be related. Because of this small feature and others like it, a new genus was dubbed, and that's Nathomortis, with the scientific name Stadmani being kept even throughout the new naming process. It's also important to note that there needs to be a lot more work done with this particular specimen, as currently we're not exactly sure where in the Mosasaur family tree it belongs, but it's most likely a very basal member of the entire clade, or very closely related to the Globidens clade, which includes things like Globidens. While the phylogenies are up, which do show how it is related to the different Mosasaurs, I do want to mention that in these phylogenies, it is still called Prognathodon, although with the air quotes around it. And that's because the official new name doesn't come until later in the paper, after these phylogenies are presented. As for our other new Mosasaur, we are still looking at a fossil that had already been described. However, this one was thought to be Platycarpus tychodon, a name which does already exist, and so this one got not only a new genus name, but a new species name as well. Gavialomimus almagabrensis is a new species of mosasaur coming from the Cretaceous of Morocco. It was so named because it is very closely to being a mimic of the genus Gavial, or more commonly known, the Gariel. Like the Gariel, Gavialomimus also had a very long and narrow snout, which likely would have been used for catching fish, something that is somewhat unthought of when we think of mosasaurs. However, that's largely due to very specific behaviors that are seen in the most commonly studied ones. And this includes animals like Tylosaurus and the Tylosaurs, which were very large-bodied and hunted very large prey. Or things like Globidens, which had rounded teeth which would have been used for crushing ammonites and other hard-shelled animals. Gavialomimus, with its long, narrow snout, probably hunted fish and squid, fast-moving prey that would also be fairly slippery, and that narrow snout would have helped it to move through the water faster so that it could hold on to these slippery prey. However, it also shows that the Mosasaurs probably had more diversity than what we normally think of, with many of the fish-eating niches likely filled by other fish, things like Xyphactinus, whereas this is a totally unique strategy, as far as we know for now at least, in the Mosasaurs. And finally, we're out of the scientific papers and just going to a new story about something that will very likely have a scientific paper coming out in the near future, and that is a fossilized cave bear was pulled out of the Siberian tundra in melting permafrost. That means that this animal has fur, muscle, potentially even stomach contents, and the paper will hopefully go into some of these. It's important to note with what is likely this upcoming paper that this wouldn't be the first time we've gotten DNA from cave bears, and so any of the DNA that is found won't necessarily be totally unique or novel or present a lot of new ideas for our understanding of how the bears may have diverged. Instead, it's more likely different proteins in the muscles that are preserved, and potentially, again, even stomach contents, that'll help us to understand how the different behaviors of the cave bears may have helped them to succeed, but then also die out. Additionally, I do want to mention that this fossil is about 22,000 years old, meaning it was very much living alongside some of the indigenous peoples that were first settling this part of Siberia, and potentially even migrating across the Bering Land Bridge into North America. This means that the ancestors of many people around today may have seen and interacted with this bear, and also that any of the behaviors that we can understand from it can also help us understand how humans might have interacted with their environments when we were first migrating across the planet. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I just want to mention that yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day and that we support all the Indigenous peoples. Um, I also want to mention that we now have a Patreon, including our first patron, Sean White, who's one of the smartest and nicest people I know, and ladies, he is single. I do want to mention we do have our store, which will be linked down below, where you can get awesome stickers. With that in mind, everyone be safe, take care, wear a mask, and don't go extinct.